Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. So thanks for joining us today for this virtual innovation workshop on transactions for growth. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am Aline, uh, Head of Innovation Support at One Nucleus. And just to give you a bit of context background on these sessions, which is the second one of the Virtual Innovation Center. Um, it is based on um, reflecting on what One Nucleus does, which is really supporting companies in their growing activities in general. And so trying to structure this support to companies who are going through, let's say, a post acceleration stage, post raising initial funding. And so looking at either the next strategic development or becoming more operational or more active deal makers, uh, we decided to invite and leverage the expertise that we have within the One Nucleus Network uh, to support companies in these expansion phases. And so to offer very specific workshops like this one today on specific topics that they would have interest in uh, and so learning more and so being connected with the experts that we have in the network. So today is about transactions, uh, whether it's M&A or licensing and so all type of more strategic business development activities that companies um, may go through when they are growing. And so I'm delighted to be joined today by our uh, partners at Taylor Wessing, Ross McNaughton, Adrian Tutungi, and Oli Den, uh, who will give you a short presentation about their expertise in that space, what companies need to do and to be prepared as possible um, as they can be. And then of course, we will open the floor for questions afterwards. So um, feel free to drop any comment or question you may have in the chat box uh, and we'll pick up on them afterwards. So leaving the floor to you and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, thanks, Aline. And, um, and th thanks everyone for joining. And um, maybe just to start with a round of um, of introductions. So, um, as Ali mentioned, um, Adrian and Ollie and I are from Taylor Wessing. Uh, for those of you who don't know the firm, we are um, widely regarded as the leading tech and life sciences law firm, um, and we're based across 28 jurisdictions worldwide, um, including in Cambridge. So, um, and of course, London. So, Adrian and Ollie and I are all based in the Cambridge office. And in terms of our um, our, our, our specific areas of focus individually. Um, so I'll start with myself and then hand over to, to Adrian and Ollie. But um, I am focused on um, corporate transactions, so um, venture capital, MA, and uh, capital markets as well. Um, and then maybe to hand over to you, Adrian. Yeah, hi. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be able to spend some time together this, uh, this lunchtime. I'm by background, an IP lawyer and a life science regulatory lawyer. So I help clients in their partnering transactions, their in licensing and their out licensing. Hi everyone. And um, <clears throat> I've recently joined TW at the start of this year, um, like Ross focused more on the corporate side of things. So um, either the fundraising type work and, um, and also M&A and, and a little bit of ECM too. Right. So um, I think I'm hoping everyone can see um, the slides and, um, <clears throat> and just to kind of reiterate what Aline was saying earlier. So, I mean, to the extent that um, you have any questions as we go along, then feel free to, you know, raise them in the chat box, put your hand up, whatever, um, and or even just, you know, chip in. There'll also be time for um, a discussion at the end. We've got an hour. Um, we're not going to speak for that long um, so you know we do want to make it um, interactive to the extent we can a lot of the comment a lot of the topics that we're going to talk about today um, are you know pretty sort of broad ranging in their nature so necessarily we're just um, you know picking on a few um, specific aspects within them to, um, to to focus in on um, but you know again we could probably talk about all of these sorts of things for uh, you know for a day so very happy to kind of go into various you know aspects of it um, to the extent anyone's got any sort of detailed questions. So um, Ollie and I are going to take the first bit, which is um, preparing for a capital raising um, and an M&A. And I mean, just to, first of all, just to set the set the scene. So, you know, obviously life sciences generally is having its kind of moment in the, in the spotlight right now, um, sort of, you know, as a, you know, partly as a result of um, 
the kind of reshaping of the economy towards the knowledge economies, um, you know, generally, particularly in the sort of post-Brexit environment, but also um, it's been thrown into sharp, um, you know, sharp, into the sharp spotlight with, um, you know, the COVID pandemic, et cetera. And obviously um, that had um, a bit of an impact on deal uh, volume, um, both on the, cap uh, on the venture side and also on the M&A side, uh, particularly in the early days. Um, but, um, you know, after, you know, three months or so of, um, of relative uncertainty in the sort of, you know, Q2 of, of last year, things have settled down, particularly after the summer last year, and have actually, you know, pretty much accelerated away. So, you know, M&A activity was, um, you know, relatively, you know, has, has basically sort of like picked up, um, you know, after that initial um you know, slow down and there's a lot of activity in the market um, right now to the extent actually, to be honest, to the, the, to, to the extent that it's sort of dipping into a bit of um, deal fatigue, I think, but um, it's been an extremely active kind of six months or so. Um, and, and I think the long-term forecast or at least the medium-term forecast, um, you know, from, from ours and from people, you know, other people that are in the market is that, um, that there's no signs of that kind of abating um albeit i do think there's going to be a little bit of a, a of a lull over this you know a bit of a dip over the summer but um but but, but generally i think things are um in, in relatively um relatively good shape um and so what we wanted to talk about um and and you know again we've got some stats there which we picked up from a couple of um pwc and and, and as young reports um but what we wanted to um, talk about um, in the first instance is, um, is you know, what to think about in terms of a typical funding round um, and or M&A. Um, and again, just to sort of set the context, the, the, the purpose of this session is to really you know, help people think through what they can do to prepare in advance for, um, you know, a transaction. So whether that transaction is a um, is, is a financing event, um, and particularly here we're looking at private financings, IPOs are a bit of a, a, a different process in and of themselves. We don't quite touch on them um, here because they, again, they in themselves could take up a whole um, you know, a whole session or, or several actually. Um, and so what, what we're focusing on here for the first instance is um, you know venture financing rounds, growth financing rounds. And M and A, and then Adrian's going to pick up and talk about licensing um, in, in a moment. Um, but but in terms of you know fundraising and or M and A, and again, many of you will no doubt have been through this already. So um, much of this is is, is is quite possibly known. But just to kind of recap and just to sort of give a few sort of stories from the trenches, if you like, in terms of how things can be made more efficient it's a, and, and effective um, when you've got a deal that that's you know come along. So first of all, I mean. The, the first thing to think about is um, you know, what it is that an investor or a buyer in an M&A context is, is looking at. So when they're looking at taking your business, what, what is in the back of their minds? What do they want to see? And the things that they will weigh up is the strength of the technology, um, the market opportunity for them, uh, and their ability to capture some of that market with your, with your technology, the strength of the team they're getting, IP protection, and of course, synergy and complementary benefits. And that will basically you know, frame the bulk of their due diligence, um, whether that's legal, accounting, market, or IP due diligence. Um, they will be the kind of five key things that they're looking at um, in terms of assessing whether or not to go ahead with that transaction. And when you have an M&A um, opportunity, um, there are a couple of things that you need to sort of think through in advance and these are the sort of sticking points that that we see and again this is all a very high level but these are the kind of sticking points that we see on, on transactions um you know on a day-to-day -day basis so i mean the first one that is that, that obviously grabs the headlines right is the is the price what is the price that the company is uh, that, that the buyer is looking to you know to pay for the business and in particular, and how are they going to structure that? So um, 
that can come in a variety of forms. So, you know, to the extent that the business is a drug discovery business, you might see um, some form of milestone um, payment, you know, arrangements to the extent that the, um, that the business is um, more in the kind of med tech space or CRO space, you know, services, something like that, then you'll, you'll have to, to think about other um, aspects as well in terms of things like um, whether or not the structure that you're going to have is a completion account structure versus lockbox structure. And just to you know, give a very brief overview of, of what they are, um, for, for those kind of op more sort of oper operation, operating businesses, what you tend to have is a, um, you know, you have an enterprise value, which is the price, the business is sold as at completion. There is then with a completion account structure, a period post completion to effectively true up for the level of assets that come across um, on the balance sheet. Um, that has a bit of a lag time to it because it takes the it takes a while to get the accounts in order. Um, and so, and then there's an adjustment kind of after the event um, to, to to either you know pay more to the sellers uh, to the extent the um, the the assets on the balance sheet or the specified assets on the balance sheet are more than expected or to result in a payment back to the buyer to the extent they're less. With a lockbox structure, you basically set that in advance. So you pick a, line, a date that's the line in the sand before closing and you say that is the date that we are valuing the business at. And that means that you make the payment as at completion. You don't have to worry about a lockbox, uh, a completion accounts um, adjustment after the event. Um, Another thing to think about as well, particularly if you're a venture backed company is um, is the waterfall um, thinking about how the, the 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 value the price that is paid is going to drip out um, over time um, and particularly for example, you know if there's a, a, a try you know a, a milestone payments or if there's money being released from escrow which we'll come on to in a minute um, but basically if the, if all of the money is not paid up on completion and there's going to be subsequent payments again whether it's completion accounts payments whether it's a milestone payment whether it's release of escrow um, you need to think through how the waterfall works in your um in, in your documents now <clears throat> normally if there's a if 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 there's a you know if there's a non-participating preference and um the investors elect to um to call that to use that so to the extent that the the business is being sold for less than the last valuation round under the articles they will almost certainly be entitled to receive you know every penny of the payments out until their liquidation preference has been satisfied and only then do the ordinaries get paid out after the event so having to think through from a very early stage as to um, how the payments are going to go in and what the waterfall looks like at the other end you know can be can, you know can be quite well it's actually very important because um that kind of frames a lot of the um a lot, a lot of the discussions around you know what you're going to accept for things like escrow warranties indemnities and tax covenants and that sort of thing so just moving on to that um that next point so it is quite common with deals that um there will be an escrow provision um so that um to the extent there's any you know warranties or indemnities um that need to be called upon um, or indeed, to the extent that there's any, um, you know, adjustment in the completion accounts, there will often be some money left back um, within an escrow account for a certain period of time, you know, often sort of anywhere between kind of 12 and 36 months. Um, and, and that escrow is the primary source of, or the, um, yeah, the primary source of um, recourse for the, for, for, for the buyer um, to the extent that, there's, that it wants to, you know, claim under those um, those various point, um, bits. And again, just with venture-backed companies, one of the key things to think through is how that sort of feeds through into the walls fall and, and how that money gets paid out um, uh, over time. In terms of warranties and, and indemnities, um, Ollie's going to cover those um, in, in a minute, but the, the broad concept is, um, you know, buyer beware. So the buyers are going to look, look at the um, uh, at, at the company and ask you to stand behind the warranties in a sorry stand behind a certain set of warranties to you know confirm um their understanding um of what it is that they're getting with the business warranties are a statement of fact effectively uh, st are statements of fact setting out what the business looks like at any one particular time 
and um, uh, uh, and they effectively supplement the buyer's diligence um, exercise. And you know, to the extent that they're incorrect, then uh, and you don't disclose against them, the buyer's recourse. Um, and of course, that's similar. You know, I mean, we're talking about M and A here, but of course, it's similar on a funding round as well. And for those of you who've been through that, will be aware of the a, a similar process. It's just that what what tends to happen is that on a on a venture process, the M and A, the the warranty exercise, tends to be a bit um, a, a bit lighter than it does in an M and A context. Um, indemnities, um, similarly to the extent, you know. Um, there's a, an issue that sits within the business that is uncovered by the buyer's due diligence or that is, that is disclosed um, under the warranties because they lose recourse once um, something has been um, what, what, once something has been um, disclosed under the warrant they can't then claim under the warranties um, they will often uh, buyers will often insist on um, an indemnity so you know to the extent there's a bit of litigation for example they will also ask for an indemnity commonly um, for any tax liabilities running to the period up to, to completion. So oh, they're one of the, the, the aspects that you're going to have to, you know, sort of forward think when you're walking into a deal like this. And, and one of the other aspects to that as well is who's going to give that. So to the extent you have a business, which is, you know, very, very common where you've got, um, you know, a couple of, you know, a handful of people within management that have a sizable chunk of the equity as well and a tail of shareholders and or uh, to the extent that you have you know corporate um, sellers as well so venture capital in there too all of these considerations around warranties and indemnities become a little bit more tricky because who is going to stand behind them um, on the one you know for example it's hard to ask for um, you know angel investors who you know may have been in the company from a very early stage to stand behind business warranties um equally the corporate vcs will be extremely reluctant to give any um any warranties in relation to anything other than their own title and capacity and so for that reason we see more and more deals where insurance is cropping into the market into into the market so um i mean m a insurance or warranty and indemnity insurance has been around for you know, in the UK for I don't know, probably about 10 years now, um, maybe probably a bit longer, 12 maybe. Um, but um, but 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 it's used on you know a lot of deals these days, and, and particularly where there's um, you know difficulty in finding someone who's going to um, stand behind the warranties. And so um, what what the insurance does is it basically it's a premium, it's a, it's a policy you know, with a premium associated that gives the, um, the the buyers recourse to that policy. Um, you also have to think of a little bit about restrictive covenants and you know what the um, what the buyers won't want is for you to you know leave and and go and sort of set out um, set up shop doing something um, exactly similar. Chances are they want you in the in the business. Um, I, again, you know there, there will likely be you know some sort of milestones or possibly earnouts as well um, to you know to keep you incentivized and in the business post closing uh, to help with that transition to. And then the other issue, the final issue that I want to talk about just before handing over to Ollie is just in relation to um, forward thinking again about how we're actually how you know how we're actually going to get these um, this this deal signed up. So almost all deals in the U with a UK company end up being um, a share sale rather than an asset sale. Um, asset sales are relatively popular um, in 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 the US, for example, pr primarily because you can leave behind liabilities. Um, but in the UK, um, largely for tax reasons, <coughs> the um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a share sale that is the common construct. Um, and so when you have a whole tail of, um, you know, if you have a company that has got a whole tail of minority shareholders or a large portion of option holders, you're going to have to think quite early on about how it is you're going to message to the shareholders um, and or option holders what the deal is how you're going to get them along to sign what you're going to do if they're you know on holiday um, or can't be found or if you've lost their address or whatever it might be um, those sorts of aspects come up quite a lot and um, and within the UK it's actually it's actually relatively uncommon that people call on drag along rights um, 
so I mean, our, our view as a firm is that drag along rights, which again, for those of you who've been through a VC round, um, will we'll know um, are a set of rights in the articles that say that when you have a certain percentage of shareholders who want to sell um, their shares, they can force the others, the minority to, sh to sell as well. Um, you know, those, those drag along rights, to be fair, are pretty robust in terms of their standing, but, um, but buyers do get a bit um, nervous around them. Um, our, our view is it, it's a little bit less so with US buyers, and um, particularly because in the US they don't necessarily need to get to 100% um, on, on their deals to you know, affect a merger, for example. Um, <clears throat> but in the UK, they do tend to, buyers do tend to prefer a, a, a wholly consensual um, sale. And so they expect, um, you know, 100, typically it's about 100% of the shareholders to sign up. So again, it's just one of those aspects that's just worth thinking through in terms of, you know, where are your signatories, where are your shareholders, where are the option holders? Um, and then with that, Ollie, do you want to take the next slide, which is on um, due diligence, warranties and disclosure, and then sort of end with some practical tips on how to get yourself in a position to, to, to sell? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ross. Um, <clears throat> so we thought we'd just pick up on uh, one of those themes and look at it in a bit, bit greater detail and um, then also just think about some of the sort of practical steps that you could be taking at this stage to make sure that you're prepared for the process as and when it comes up. So um, as Ross met, it, Ross talks a little bit about warranties and indemnities. I think it, that there are there are sort of three relevant topics to this general theme, which is the, the due diligence process, the warranties and, and the disclosure exercise. So just taking a bit of a step back and talking through what those are and how they inter interrelate at a very high level. Um, so, I mean, buyer or in the case of a fundraising investor diligence is likely to be a, a pretty significant work stream in almost all corporate transactions. Um, generally tends to be a bit quicker on fundraisings and a bit more light touch. And then on M&A uh, deals, you'll get, um, you'll, you'll get a slightly more thorough process. Um, but that, that can be sort of, in some cases, weeks and even 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 months worth of work for, for, for the larger transactions. Um, the reason that we have such thorough diligence process is that the, the sort of general position under English law is that the onus is on the buyer or the investor to identify um, any risks and, and issues and be comfortable that that that, that they know um, you know that they know everything they need to know about the business that they're either buying or investing in. Um, so with, with some very limited exceptions, there isn't really a, a, a sort of requirement um, as a matter of law for the, for the company or the, the target company to, to sort of proactively identify those to, to, to the counterparty. So um, that, that's sort of the backdrop for why this becomes such a thorough process in most of, um, in most of the transactions that, that, that you'll see. Um, the, the way the sort of process generally kicks off is that you'll get a, 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 a diligence checklist um, that'll be prepared by uh, the, the buyer or their, or, or their lawyers. Um, and this will ask certain questions uh, of predominantly the company, but also particularly in the fundraising context and for earlier stage investments, um, the founders in their personal capacity to complete. Um, it'll generally speaking be a pretty thorough document um, and especially with uh, you know smaller deals or yeah, earlier stage companies, you tend to find that many of the many of the items aren't aren't things that are necessarily relevant but they they tend to be they tend to be quite thorough um sort of requests um and that there's a sort of iterative process of here's here's a spreadsheet now give us the, give us the stuff and we'll, we'll we'll come on to how that's done in practice when we talk about vdrs on the on the next slide um so the 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 that, that sort of process is then supplemented by the warranties that Ross mentioned, which effectively is sort of intended to give this process of requesting information some teeth, because when it comes to signing the, the purchase agreement in the case of an MA transaction or the subscription agreement in the case of a fundraising, um, that they'll they'll have they'll include a pretty comprehensive set of statements of facts that are made about the company predominantly, but again in the fundraising context. Uh, often the founders are also asked to um, to make certain specific warranties, um, and essentially by by including those in the documents, then there's sort of a a, 
a, a recourse in the in the event that those statements aren't true, which which sort of then forces the hand of the uh, of the company into into providing information that's relevant to those statements. Um, so although they are contractual recourse, really their their primary purpose is to supplement the diligence process and and um, and ensure that the responses that they're getting through the questionnaires are accurate. Um, <clears throat> there's then as as we mentioned, you know, the, the sort of secondary purpose, which is that they're there to provide contractual recourse to the buyers or investors. So, you know, to the extent that I don't know, a company was subject to a big piece of litigation, um, there would be a warranty in the uh, in the agreement that says that there is no ongoing litigation. Um, and if if subsequently that litigation, you know, came came to pass and and the investors or the buyer suffered loss as a result of it, they would have a, a, a cause of action against the, the company or the sellers, as, as the case may be, um, in order to be able to, um, to, to, to reclaim the losses, um, given that the statement, that the warranty that there was no litigation at the time of, um, of the transaction wasn't true. Um, and the way that the company will, the, the sort of, the, the way in which company and sellers can mitigate uh, that, that sort of risk is through what's called a disclosure process, which is essentially where, uh, and, and for those who have been through fundraising, you'll be familiar with this process where you, you, you'll have been asked to go through the warranties, identify any known issues. Um, if there are known issues, they go in the disclosure letter um, and provided that they've been adequately disclosed, um, they they're then they then can't, those facts then can't form the basis of any claim um, under any of the warranties. Um, so, Thinking about um, thinking about how we would prepare for a legal diligence process. Um, I mean, there, there, there are just a few sort of points here around around just sort of I suppose general housekeeping in the main, but just some things that that, that can be that can be sort of if, if you can keep on top of them from now, will will make the process significantly easier as and when it comes up. So. Um, I mean, generally speaking, corporate governance. Um, I mean, this encompasses both sort of the statutory requirements under the Companies Act and and, and certain other bits, pieces of legislation, but also your sort of legal and commercial best practice. Um, so, you know, as I say, where where you have sort of inadequate governance revealed as part of a diligence process, this tends to add time to what is already often a, a pretty lengthy process. So, you know, if you have to go back and and Sort of remedy things that weren't necessarily done correctly when when they were originally done it, it it can sort of add whole new work streams to 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 to, to the transaction in general um and that obviously goes to time and time and costs and 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 ultimately if you know heaven forbid but in some cases it it can it can sort of create a major um a, a major commercial sort of issue between between counterparties if if things haven't necessarily been been sort of done properly from the outset so um yeah i mean as i say the the the, the statutory stuff so you know things like keeping making sure that company books are maintained particularly things like register of members directors secretaries and pscs which is persons of significant control um they're all things that that you know people do sometimes just overlook but but which then when you come to a process where you've got a buyer about to launch sort of embark on their diligence Pro, uh, pro process you you then sort of have a bit of a frantic um trying to get ducks in a row to make sure that um everything's fixed and, and all correct um it's worth saying that you know, law firms and other sort of company secretarial providers in the market are sort of able to generally offer pretty um sort of competitive and reasonable rates for looking after those types of things um if it's something that 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 people are not minded to do in-house um but then there's also just generally that you know it's worth worth remembering that there are statutory requirements for a number of um, corporate actions, um, things that are often relevant for for venture and growth bank companies are you know issuing new shares, granting EMI options, um, and the statutory requirements around those can be quite fiddly. Um, and just because a set of documentation works for any one issue, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will work for the next one um, because it may well be that something slightly different is happening. Um, you know, the, the 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 law may have changed slightly. Basically, if in doubt, would always ask to spare having to go and deal with it and remedy it again at, at, at the 
at the stage where someone goes and has a look at the books and tries to, to work out what's happened. Um, and then outside of those sort of technical statutory requirements, I think is a more sort of best practice. So, I mean, you know, that there are certain things in the companies out that you that you have to have recorded board approval for, but I think in general, it's also worth bearing in mind that the, the, the more key decisions can be recorded in writing, the better. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be in formal board minutes, but you know, you could also write up internal memoranda of decision making around that. Um, this isn't to try and encourage everyone to sort of keep a diary of everything that happens on a day to day basis, but more just that where we've got sort of key strategic decisions, you know, signing up big signing up big new contracts, a sort of decision to start exploring a different area of of, of sort of commercial strategy, you know, adopting a a, a change to the business plan, et cetera. Um, all things which, you know, you, you may also need to go back to your investors for anyway. Um, but to the extent that these can be um that these sorts of things, you know, really should be recorded in some form of writing. Um and um, you know, when buyers come to do their diligence, they they, they, they will expect to see sort of a, a, a paper trail of, of wherever sort of big decisions have been made, how those decisions were arrived at and um, uh, and recorded in the company's books. Um, and then I think just like from a pure process perspective, I mentioned BDRs on the previous slide. So generally speaking, where, where you have an M&A process or, or a fundraising, you'll, you'll have a virtual data room set up as a means of information sharing um, and providing sort of the responses to the diligence questionnaires that that, that I referred to um, before, but also just more generally providing information about the opportunity. Um, so, you know, to the extent you get a chance to just generally familiarize yourself with some of the, the larger VDR providers, um, Many law firms all have all have their own platforms, but there are also some independent platforms that people like to use. Um, you know, other, other things you could think about. I mean, just generally the the, the maintenance of records. I think you know the the, the more the, the 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 closer you can be to having a sort of neatly packaged um, set of records that um, you know would would be sort of broadly structured in the way that you would expect a VDR to be structured. Means the, the more quickly you'll be able to get that room set up um, and generally if you can present a pretty comprehensive package of information to a buyer or an investor within a reasonably short time frame of them having asked for it or with it or, or, or of the process having been initiated then that will be that will be sort of a tick in the box in terms of you know showing that the company is, is well run and well organized um, and I think what you'll find when you, you sort of link to that when when you get to the, the the actually carrying out the diligence process, allocating responsibilities becomes quite important, um, and people tend to sort of run through those questionnaires that I mentioned and say, well, you know, this is this is for X person to look after, this is for Y person to look after, and you can sort of to agree to to a degree pre-wire that with your sort of internal allocations when it comes to how you keep your records um, and to the extent that the process that you do with um that you know when, when you come to the actual diligence process can just piggyback off the back of that then then that that tends to make the process um uh, more, more efficient in our experience um so yeah so th th those were just some some tips on that topic and um and unless anyone's got any questions i'll hand over to adrian Thank, thanks can i just um just sort of jump in on that as well so uh, i and i mean a, lo a lot of the stuff on this slide sounds sort of fairly um Kind of, kind of obvious, but we 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 see the sort of whole spectrum, right? And so, some of the you know some some companies are you know very um, very very good at this and are able to produce you know just a shiny pack, sort of neatly packaged up um, sort of you know history of their you know company and and how it all uh, sort of fits together. Um, others have clearly been sort of swept up in either you know rev getting revenues or or you know. Um, in the science and, and and the this kind of aspect has, you know, understandably sort of to a degree like taken a, a, a bit of a step back when they've been advanced in the business. But this is the shop window, right? So as soon as you get to a, 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 a transaction, this is the bit where we see friction actually. And so you know, if if, if you can get on top of this um, as you're going along, um, then it makes a massive, massive difference. Um, but anyway, with that, I'm Adrian, do you want to talk, um, about biopharma partnering? 
Yeah, sure. So um, if we can move on then. And so just to set the scene here, obviously we've heard from Ross and Ollie about capital raising and we've heard about M&A and the third sort of bucket of significant transactions for growth that you may be thinking of as you move through your corporate life cycle will be partnering. And that can be um, as something as simple as an in-license or an out-license of technology, normally patented technology in this sector, to more complicated deal structures where we're talking, for example, about a collaborative development phase followed by a commercialization phase. There may be options built into there. In the commercialization phase, you may then get things like co-marketing or co-promotion. So more complicated commercial arrangements for commercialization, joint commercialization. Um, so today we're, sort of, we're, we're talking in general terms about all those types of transactions. Um, I think we have in mind as a sort of paradigm example, a fairly traditional partnering of a new chemical entity or a new biological entity asset. But in fact, a very similar process and very similar practical tips apply to other more innovative technologies, um, for example, bringing together of um, AI functionality, for example, in the drug discovery process, quantum chemistry in the drug discovery process, or, or novel modalities around um, cell therapy or gene therapy. So I think nothing that we're saying today is meant to be particularly focused. The other thing I'll be pleased to hear is we're not really get, going to get into legal issues around, for example, um, what you'd expect to see in a term sheet for one of these partnering transactions or the types of bumps in the road and tricky issues that you could expect when you do a when you're negotiating a full agreement. What we're going to focus on today are just um, in, in line with uh, the brief that we got from Aline, some practical tips really around how to approach and prepare yourself for a partnering process. And then we'll look, um, we've just got two or three slides with, with some data from the last 12 months, um, well, going back to 2020 really, just talking about some trends that we've seen in the market in partnering. So we'll start off on this slide with just some of the open questions about, well, why might you think of partnering your asset instead of doing capital raising or an M&A? Uh, and, and just taking these points in turn, none of this I think is particularly insightful or, or earth shattering, but it may be useful just to run through them quickly. Obviously, primarily you can raise some non-dilutive funding. You'll have some upfronts and some milestones you can use this as a way of extending runway. Um, and indeed, during um, 2020, particularly sort of Q2 onwards in 2020, once the pandemic hit, the response of a lot of biotech companies to the short term drying up of capital was we have to do some partnering activities um, as a way of getting through the disruption the delays being caused to clinical programs and data gathering, Let, let's do a partnering transaction, typically a secondary asset or in a secondary jurisdiction, let's not partner our key program, um, but we have to do something to raise some money to keep the lights on and keep our, push out our runway until, until the pandemic passes. Um, obviously you can offload a lot of the expense or significant amounts of expense in getting a product to market can then be shared with your partner. You can bring in the expertise of the partner, typically around the regulatory process. Uh, I think that was sort of traditionally one of the justifications for partnering, particularly with Big Pharma, their expertise in getting products through the regulatory process in the various key markets globally. But also after that, their expertise and their sales forces, particularly for products which require a sales force, for example, those in, in primarily prescribed in, in primary care. Um, then you can, you can tap into their expertise in the commercialization phase of a, a product's life cycle. Um, partnering is great for credibility, um, for validation of you as a company, as a management team, as a platform, as a technology. Um, having one high profile partnership um, makes it a lot easier to then do subsequent deals down the line because it, it all builds credibility. Um, and then, as we've said, better, better chances of actually ultimate commercial success and getting marketing approval because of the expertise of your partner in meeting the needs, dealing with the concerns that any regulators may have. But I think you have to set off against those early questions um, as to why might we want to partner your asset. 
um, some questions around what are the potential downsides? Will your partner align with your vision for the company or for that asset? Um, and in particular, for example, if it's an asset that has got multiple indications or potential indications, then how do you get some alignment around how to prioritize? Which ones will you go for first? How quick, quickly will you try and expand the label and bring on additional indications? Um, what else is the partner doing in that therapeutic area? What is their vision? Um, all of those issues around, you know, how do you choose somebody who's going to be a good partner? Um, would a partnership increase probability of success? How are you defining success for you and for your shareholders and your other stakeholders? Um, partnerships can increase complexity. A, a lot of internal resource can be devoted to managing those alliances once you've inked them. Um, so you have to think quite sensibly and level-headedly about those type of downsides. And clearly you have to think alternative sources of funding. Um, could we instead be raising money from VCs or from other types of um, financial investor? Uh, or could we be doing an M&A and trying to progress this as part of a, a bigger group? And one of the things we'll come and talk about on the next slide or the next couple of slides is, is the need to try and run, in, in some cases, run these two processes in parallel. Um, you can't be sure which one will succeed. They can both be quite time consuming, so they're not quick processes to run. And in order to maximize the chances of, of there being a, a good outcome for the company and you're not running out of, of runway, then um, in many cases, people run a twin track approach of, of considering a financial investment in parallel with a partnering. Can we have the next slide, please? So clearly one of the first issues you'll be thinking about when you're having decided in principle to partner, um, valuation of, of asset, what can we be asking for here? How do we structure the commercial terms will be a key, um, key thought. And again, I think there's no particular genius on this slide, but some of the really obvious points, what data have you got? Preclinical, clinical data, um, if you've got robust and attractive data that's very persuasive, and that will clearly help to accelerate you up to uh, higher valuations than would be the case if the data was a bit more equivocal. And for that reason, companies who are experienced in doing partnering deals think about value inflection points being, being the points really when data becomes available. Um, so if you get some exciting data, um, you can do some pretty attractive deals pretty early on. I think it, it's all very much data driven. Other things you'll be thinking about are, what are your competitors doing? So who else is addressing this particular therapeutic need? How far advanced is their program? Is there a risk that whoever you partner with will end up facing competition in the market with a, with a number of Me Too products, um, which might erode their, yeah, their exclusivity, their margin? Clearly, another thought is what is the adjustable market here? So what, what sort of indication are you looking at? What are the patient populations? What is the size of the market? Do you have any other assets to sweeten the deal? This is something we've seen something of a trend of, I guess, in the last 18 to 24 months. Um, rather than partnering just a single asset transaction, then the attraction of, of multiple assets. Um, fallback programs, alternative modalities, alternative compounds, for example. Um, it means that from your partner's point of view, they've got fewer eggs in one basket. They've got some ability to sort of spread risk across a number of potential products. Do you have established partnering relationships already? Um, that might help you attract higher valuation. Equally, if your management team have got a great track record, then again, that's a really persuasive um, thing for larger pharma, big pharma, if I call them that, to, um, to attract them even to pretty early stage companies. And, and we see that locally, companies which have um, management teams that have been through the process once or twice uh, with successful exits and successful products, find it, um, I think, easier, but also attract higher valuations earlier on than um, than they would do if they were coming to this first time round. 
um, think about generating competitive tension. So again, you, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, even on just in relation to the partnering side of the world. So you'll, you'll want to try and engage <clears throat> and take forward discussions, partnering discussions with a number of potential partners, at least to some extent, um, in order to create some competitive tension and make your big pharma partners think that they're in a bit of a battle, that there's some time pressure, some valuation pressure um, for your asset. Thinking about how you might then, in, in terms of those are sort of high level, I guess, considerations about how you might go around thinking about value in, in terms of figures on the page and um, the maths of how it's done. Um, you can take an approach of looking at sort of sunk costs. What, what have you what have you incurred so far? You can do a sort of discounted cash flow approach of thinking about what the future revenues would be if you get the product to market and it's authorized and then work out what the present value of, of that future cash flow would be. You can clearly look at comparables, both in terms of um, companies, but also products, assets at a similar stage for a similar indication. Um, and do your research, try and find out what valuations they attracted. Um, and industry deal averages as well. Some of the data we'll come on and talk about uh, very shortly um, are industry deal averages. They, one of the difficulties with industry deal averages are just a slight lack of transparency. The, it tends to be listed companies who are obliged to publish their deals, but they're only obliged to publish some of the bigger deals. And then companies that aren't by listing rules obliged to publish typically publish deals, again, which, which they're proud of, which tend to be the bigger ones. So the, there's a bit of a, a sort of self-declaration bias towards the bigger value deals, which can skew some of the industry deal average data. Um, so don't feel too disappointed if the sort of milestones or upfronts that are being put on the table seem to be at the lower end of what the deal averages are suggesting. Then that could simply be that you're, you're, at, you're in a deal which overall isn't one of the blockbuster deals, one of the blockbuster partnerings that, that, that do happen. If we move on to the next slide, please. If we think about process, um, clearly uh, the first point is just following on from what we've already said, have a number of irons in the fire, um, a number of frogs as it were. Um, how you go about finding companies to engage with who are willing to have conversations, um, we could probably talk about clearly not a primarily, it's not a legal issue. That, Many companies, particularly local, lots of one nucleus companies have got their own BD functions internally. So the VP business development, um, whose role is essentially to build relationships with companies who may be interested in um, the, the assets that are being progressed in house um, and to essentially to run this process. Um, other companies who are earlier stage don't have that luxury of someone who's dedicated to it. But again, they will be networking, they'll be using their contacts, they'll be using their investors' contacts to make introductions at the right moment to the big pharma BD teams. And they're clearly big pharma have teams dedicated to finding promising assets and bringing them in house doing these partnering transactions. We've talked about keeping alternatives, not just in terms of the identity of who your partner will be, but also alternatives to partnering on the table, um, so conversations with VCs or with trade buyers to the extent that you can manage that um, should, should be kept going because we don't know which one will ultimately be successful. In terms of typical timelines, um, partnering is not a quick process. Um, and if we just flip on to the, to the next slide briefly, we've got a sort of triage um, of, of the process. So this is what a, thinking about this from a big pharma point of view, so the people you'll be interacting with and looking to target, then I think these are very approximate figures of what they will typically do in a year. So per therapeutic area, their BDT might see 500 opportunities um, of which, and, and those type of opportunities might be a sort of a two page teaser document or a flyer describing your technology, some preliminary data. Um, 
of that, they might advance a hundred of those to a, a non-confidential meeting. Of course, these days that would in, invariably be online rather than face to face. Um, and then after that meeting, they might decide to progress to maybe 50 NDAs, CDAs and, and confidential meetings. So by the time, just to get through that part of the process, you were probably looking at at least two to three months. By the time you've had an initial meeting, um, it can take a month easily to, in effect, put a CDA in place by the time they send out their standard one or you send them your standard one and then the other party reviews and comments and it, it gets back. So we're already three months down the process. Um, following those CDAs being put in place, then there may be a sort of further confidential meeting. Um, then Big Pharma will probably progress maybe 20 requests to their senior management for diligence. And that represents quite a significant commitment of resource from their point of view, once they start the diligence process. That might run for a number of months before they decide whether they're actually going to commit to starting a term sheet and putting a draft term sheet on the table. Um, and then in terms of term sheet negotiations, then we're looking at maybe five, so 50% attrition rate during the term sheet phase, um, deciding to then start negotiating full agreements on five. And then that then represents a very significant commitment of resource, uh, further resource. And But typically you might find that maybe 40% of those fall away during the, the, the negotiation of the full agreement and they actually only execute um, three deals at the end of the day. So to get through that triage can easily take 12 months to 16, 12 to 18 months. Clearly during the pandemic, we saw that this happened in a very accelerated way. Um, very exceptionally, people were doing deals within a matter of weeks. Um, they went through this whole process in, in some cases, six weeks, more likely two to three months, but it was an extraordinary speeding up driven by the circumstances of what would apply in more normal times. And I think at the moment, the jury is still out as to um, how far once the pandemic pressures recede, things will move back and it'll be sort of business as usual and timelines will extend again. Um, can we flip back to the previous slide? There were a couple of points we just wanted to finish off on that. So we've talked about timelines in terms of having a good virtual data room. Ollie's talked about the data room and the contents of a data room for um, a partnering transaction will be very similar in some respects to those of, of an M&A or a fundraising. A lot of the corporate aspects will, I, I think, probably be less thoroughly diligenced. Um, and there will be less emphasis on the management team because one of the reasons why um, partnering transactions happen in preference to say an equity investment or an asset purchase is you're not the you're not committing so much up front to investing in effect in the management team. Um, but all the other points that Ross was talking about earlier in terms of market diligence, IP diligence, um, regulatory diligence, clinical diligence, all that type of stuff, all, all of those things will be of, of equal interest. Um, so having a good data room set up front um, at early doors will help you look professional. It will help keep and increase deal momentum. And it may make, it may help you create the impression that there are other people interested, which again will help you with your competitive tension tactic. Um, what you put in will clearly be sort of confidential, non-confidential presentations, summaries of your data, publications, summaries of your IP. When we get to contracts, uh, we're thinking here in particular about in licenses. If you're a spin out or you have built your, your asset on technology which you've in licensed, then that will be a critical aspect of what's of, of, of the diligence thing. But other contracts as well. So any outsourced development that you've done, um, then those R&D development agreements, employment agreements, consultancy agreements, um, scientific advisory board, uh, agreements, those type of things, anything that might be, anything that really relates to the development of the assets that you're looking to partner will be of particular interest. Things you might want to keep back and use the technology in a virtual data room to sort of keep, keep confidential would be patent filings, which are unpublished, details of chemical structures, manufacturing processes. You, you might want to keep those back till 
much later on in the process when, when you're sort of in effect convinced that your partner is committed to doing the deal. Um, the only other points to mention here really are clearly sort of prepare for the negotiations internally amongst your team, have a clearly articulated goal about what you want to achieve by the partnering, just have, have a think about what your best alternative is to doing the partnering deal, think about what you would ideally like, so your wants, but also clearly identify what, what your needs are. So things which really are your red lines, but you can't compromise. And then think about attractive ways of expressing your needs. So rather than saying, you know, 100 million is my absolute minimum up front, if you can say, the reason for that is I have some investors who want to exit, but equally I need a big chunk of that to fund the further development of the asset, um, then that will help in your, in your negotiations. Profiling your partner is clearly another important aspect, understanding what their capabilities are in order to maximize your asset value. Uh, what is their pipeline? Have they got capacity to take on this product? Uh, look at their deal history. What sort of terms do they have they offered in, in recent deals? Um, and think about, put their head on, put their hat on and think about, well, what are their wants and needs from this transaction? What are they looking to achieve? And obviously on, on our side of the table, think about the deal team. Who's going to be your lead negotiator? Who are the people in your organization who, who will play the role of the experts? Whether that is from a sort of drug discovery, drug development expert point of view, whether... Um, regulatory experts, clinical experts, that type of thing, people you can pull in on different aspects of the overall package. Um, have someone to sit in maybe for continuity on all the meetings who is, who, whose role is mainly just to keep a note of what's going on and to listen carefully. Um, and then at some point, think about your, your legal advice. Um, what's the best way of spending whatever budget you've got? If do you have internal legal um, advice in your organizations, are you going to have to go to an external council? What, what is the right moment to involve them? I'm conscious we're very close to time now. Um, so those are just some thoughts really about how you prepare for successful partnering. Um, if we just skip on three slides to talk a little bit about recent trends, just so that I can, I can look a lean in the face and say, we've done this as well. Um, so I sit on the board of the Pharmaceutical Licensing Group, which is essentially a trade association for business development professionals. And one of my colleagues on the board, Sharon Finch, runs a consultancy called Medius. So I have used some of her data. She does an annual review um, of partnering transactions. Um, and this is her data set from 2020, where she looked at I think there were 315 deals which were publicly announced uh, where the financial terms were publicly announced. Um, and there was a huge activity, as you can imagine, in 2020 around vaccine deals and therapeutics deals all related to COVID-19. Um, a lot of those financial, a lot of those deals didn't have financial terms disclosed, so they can't be included in this analysis. Uh, but otherwise, this gives, I think, some quite interesting insights into, into trends we're seeing. Um, so I think, first of all, there was a trend, or there was in 2020, there was a trend away from M&A towards licensing, um, particularly large scale sort of eye catching, headline grabbing M&A in, in the life science sector, um, which potentially showed um, uh, it could show a number of things. And one of the difficulties with these type of data is actually extracting insights from them. Um, it, it could show that big pharma was becoming more cautious about leaping in with early company acquisition um, deals and preferring to do partnering to see, as I say, the commitment of capital is a bit less, particularly if they're doing deals with people that they haven't spent a lot of time getting to know. Um, Obviously, the, the the remote process. How do you build a, how do you build relationships when you're speaking to people on Zoom all the time? You can't actually meet them face to face. Um, that might have inclined big pharma towards towards licensing transactions rather than M and A. In terms of stage of deal, I think what the data here shows is there was a decline in deals at the non clinical stage, and there was an increase in deals at the clinical stage. Um, so pretty much by 
the same amount. So there's a 10% decline in deals at the non-clinical stage, 10% uh, increase in deals at the clinical stage. And within the non-clinical stage, um, really the decline was entirely due to discovery stage deals. So the same proportion of preclinical deals was pretty much constant between the two years, but discovery deals reduced. So there was a there had in earlier years been a trend towards earlier stage deals, which are necessarily high, higher risk. Um, so I think what this marked last year, anyway, we saw a reverse of that trend and a lot of the partnering was happening a bit later on. You were the, the proportion of deals which were being done at the discovery stage were a bit lower. We've got um, a number of other, two or three other slides with some other data um, about trends in the market. But I, I mean, I'm conscious we're up against time. We, we're now on the hour. Um, we can circulate these slides to people if they're interested um, and they want to talk about that. But uh, otherwise, maybe we can follow up with another VIC session, either talking about term sheets and sort of legal issues and partnering, or we can talk about market trends if, if there's an interest, whatever works for the, for, the, um, for the faculty and for the delegates. Yes, I think that would be a good idea. Um, and if you agree, I was planning to circulate slides and recording, because I think first part definitely includes with you talking through the slides, because that gives some um, explanation and, and pointers on, on what should be considered and covered. The rest, because it's a bit more heavy data, I think it's really interesting because that set the context. But as you said, maybe people can get back to it and we could uh, rearrange session if, if that needs to be deepened and... Um, and we invite you, of course. But uh, yeah, I'm conscious of time too. So there are a few people who had to leave. They dropped me a message, been interested. They will, you know, follow up uh, and they you know, want the slides and, and recording. But maybe if we stop here, I think that's probably good, uh, good cutting time. Uh, so thanks a lot for that. Uh, as I said, if you happy for me to share, I will, and probably share with others who said they wanted to join, couldn't. Um, thank you, Simon. And, uh, and just picking up from there, but I think you're just opening some ideas for follow on on maybe either depending on one area or the other, or talking more about trends, which I think we covered in some of the sessions, but not with the, the depth of detail and with the link of what that actually means and how that translates into how, how we do deals. So uh, that, that could be a really interesting angle. So thanks a lot. Uh, Great. And I'll stop there then. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Everyone.